This spot where I'm standing used to be occupied by a building. This street didn't used to be here. There was a whole row of buildings right here and there was a narrow winding alley that you can see this is the remnant of right here. And this is actually the widest part of what used to be here. The, the rest of the alley from about this point on used to be so narrow, it was just barely wide enough for two people to walk side by side. And it was snaking between the buildings on the left and the buildings on the right. But all of these shops that you see, the restaurants, the clothing stores, none of this was here. This was all part of the gentrification of Itaewon that happened while I wasn't looking. And it's not my Itaewon. And my Itaewon is what I want to talk to you about today. I am in Itaewon. For a long time, this was the place for tourists and expats in Korea. And these days, I think most of the tourists spend their time downtown and in Hongdae, and expats spend their time everywhere. Itaewon isn't the center of expat life that it used to be. Uh, but I'm here today because Someone asked me in one of my comments if I could maybe share some memories of my time in Itaewon because I have spent a lot of time in Itaewon to be sure. Most of that was in the 90s, uh, in the 21st century, not so much. But yeah, I, I do have a lot of stories to tell and I expect that he, the commenter was looking for some stories of the wilder things I've seen here. But uh, I think I'm gonna hold off on those for now. Today, I'm just gonna focus on some more tame memories about uh, what Itaewon used to be like as a place, not so much what happened here. Memory's a tricky thing, right? But especially mine, it's not great in the best of times. And trying to remember what this place was like 32 years ago is almost 33 years ago is, uh, almost a bridge too far. <laughs> I don't have a full picture of what Itaewon was like before I got here, but apparently between the end of World War II and the early 80s, it primarily catered to the US military. So it had developed a reputation as being a seedy place, right? Bars, prostitutes, fights, that kind of thing. And I guess there were some shops here selling whatever soldiers would buy. But then in the early 80s, as they were preparing for the 88 Olympics, the government invested some resources here to clean things up a little bit in anticipation of all the tourists that were gonna be coming in. So by the time I got here in 91, this part of the, of the neighborhood, this part of the street was primarily a market, Itaewon Market, Itaewon Shijang. Uh, you know, you can see the name on the bus stop. It doesn't look like a market now. It doesn't look any different than any other, you know, commercial street in Seoul, really. But it was very different back then. The so many small shops selling, you know, inexpensive clothing items, shoes, souvenirs, all kinds of stuff. And you had street vendors lining the sidewalks just all over the place. I mean, up and down. You don't see any at all now. They, they haven't been here since, I don't know, somewhere around 2010 or so. But yeah, they used to just fill the streets, the sidewalks, and they were selling all kinds of items. And the name of the game in Itaewon Market was haggling. You could 
haggle everything. You know, any store you walked into, you could bring them down on the price. Even, you know, this old lady used to sell socks in a, from a street cart. And I occasionally bought bundles of socks for, from her. And I, I mean, I don't remember what the, the prices were. It seems like, you know, one bundle was 10,000 won. And I don't remember, it was five pairs of socks, maybe eight pair, I, I don't remember. But I remember always bringing her down when I bought socks, you know, something like 6,000, 5,000 won. That was part of the experience, it was fun. And knockoffs, there were knockoffs of so much stuff. The tourists who came were really interested in getting knockoff Gucci bags, Louis Vuitton, you know, starter jackets. My uncle visited here with a friend in the early 90s, 93, maybe 94. Uh, the one big item on their shopping list was starter jackets because you could buy knockoff starter jackets here very cheap. And right across the street over here somewhere, actually right about there, he was right next to that, uh, that, that alley there going down. Uh, there was a guy who used to stand out there with a table and as you walked by, he'd proclaim that he was selling genuine fake Rolexes. Every, every time I walked by there, I heard that. And then there were the tailors. Oh man, so many tailors. Tailor shops up and down the street and the tailors would be standing outside. And as you walked by, they'd say, excuse me, sir, would you like to buy a suit? Just again and again and again. I mean, every 15 meters or so. And in fact, when I lived uh, on the other side over there, back down at the bottom, every morning I'd come up the steps to the street and there was a tailor standing there, you know, the shops opened at 10 and I was getting up there just after the shops opened and there'd be a tailor right up there by the steps. And every day he'd ask me, would you like to buy a suit, sir? And every day I'd say, no, thank you. Persistent guy, I'll give you that. Kind of hard to believe now, but this used to be a two-lane street. They widened it not long after I got here. I don't know, maybe 93 or so. I know it was before they started the subway construction, but there used to be parasol tables over there on the other side of the street. There was a KFC and a Wendy's uh, that had parasol tables outside. And I think those went away probably around the time the street was widened. So shopping was one of the things that Itaewon was known for when I got here. The other one was the nightlife. And most of the nightlife in Itaewon in those days was pretty much just over behind the fire station up the street here. You had a handful of clubs here on the main street, uh, but not so many. I remember the Nashville Club was in one of these buildings over here. It was a popular place. They had the, the bar up uh, on the second floor. And then down in the basement, they had a restaurant that had really good steak and grilled chicken breast sandwiches. And I think a jazz bar, all that jazz, I think they were open when I first got here. I'm, I'm not really 100% sure, but they were on the main street. You had a place here called the Cowboy Bar or something. And yeah, there was uh, not, many, not many bars on the main street at that time. Okay, so we are behind the fire station now, and this is where most of the action happened back in the early 90s. The first time I came here was in January of 92. I got a pass from my company commander to come down to Seoul for the weekend, and this is where I spent most of my time. And the first uh, <laughs> site we pass here is the infamous Hooker Hill. There's nothing to it now, but in those days, going up that hill was like running a gauntlet. The prostitutes were out in the street, you know, on both sides, and they would uh, accost you as you were coming by, sometimes actually grab you and try to pull you into the, the back rooms. But at the top, there were about five or six 
hot spots where a lot of people gathered late every night. But early each night, around, I don't know, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, the place to be was right here. This is the King Club, which is a dance club, or used to be a dance club, but I assume it still is. Now it's a, a gay club, but back then that was the place to be in Itaewon if you're coming out. It's where everybody started the night, usually. And it's a gay club today because right next to it is the hill that people refer to today as Hooker Hill, uh, I'm sorry, Homo Hill. And that was not the case in the early 90s. There were no gay bars in Itaewon in the early 90s. The first one opened probably 96 or 97. I, I believe uh, it was called Why Not with a question mark. And I was acquainted with the owners. I didn't know them that well, but I was acquainted with them. And they were the first gay bar in Itaewon and they opened just right around the corner from the King Club and so that's I assume that's why the hill there uh, is where other gay bars opened later on. Okay we're walking up the hill now and all of this stuff here is going to be demolished eventually. Yeah. My memory of you know the early 90s how this looked, it, it, it's not so clear. I, I, I don't recall there being so many of these little bars on the street. I remember little alleyways to like uh, apartments back there that the prostitutes used, but uh, it's, not, it's not clear. There might've been more of those bars, but I do know that by the mid nineties, uh, yeah, this whole, this whole thing here was just a row of little bars and all of them were prostitute bars. Uh, it's getting a little noisy up here, but this was was why people came up here. Where this construction site is, there was uh, something called the Kettle House, Polly's Kettle House, and next door there was a place called the Soju Kettle House, and just out across from them there was another little kettle house, a smaller one, and a kettle house is a place that sells soju kettles. And a soju kettle, I, I believe they originally actually were in, you know, tea kettles. But by the time I got here, they were in fruit boxes. But uh, yeah, it was just soju mixed with fruit juice. And it was really popular with soldiers and uh, the expats who lived here. Everybody came and hung out at the kettle house. So, but here's the thing. One of the interesting things about hanging out in Seoul at that time was the curfew. Now, it wasn't a, a blanket curfew, it was just a curfew on the bars. The bars, any, any place selling alcohol, as far as I know, I, I could be wrong about that, but bars and clubs had to shut down at midnight and they could reopen again at 4 a.m. And so that added a lot of flavor here to Itaewon. And so what happened is, like I said, everybody started at the King Club and you would usually stay at the King Club until, I don't know, 9, 10, 11, and then you'd go somewhere else. And wherever you were at midnight, they either uh, locked you in or they had some system for letting people in and out. So at the Kettle House, their system was, they, they had these really heavy drapes that they would pull closed, you know, to prevent anybody from seeing inside, and they would lock the door. And if you wanted in, you would knock on the door, somebody inside would peek outside the drapes. If there were no cops around, they'd unlock the door and let you in. And if you were leaving, they'd peek out to make sure it's clear before they let you out. And so what a lot of people would do is they would go in and they would buy a kettle or a big bottle of beer, and then they'd come outside and just hang out in front of the kettle house in the street. And it would get really crowded up here in the spring and summer, and fall. And I tell you what, of all the experiences I've had in Itaewon, that was probably my favorite because you found yourself next to so many different people from around the world. 
and I spoke to people from countries from which I had never met anyone before, right? And, you know, you were talking to people who you might not otherwise talk to. Like, if I go to a classic rock bar, I'm not going to be sitting next to somebody probably who's really into hip hop, right? Or, you know, some other kind of music. And so it, it was just a really a big uh, uh, melting pot of, of cultures and backgrounds and interests. And I, I really enjoyed it. And, and then here you have the Grand Ole Opry and above it, the East West Club. And I was never <laughs> much of, of a patron of the Grand Ole Opry. It's not my speed, but I did go to the East West Club, a lot of classic rock up there. And I, I don't know if the Grand Ole Opry had a system, an after midnight system, they probably did, but the East West Club usually had a guy standing out on the porch. Now the, the porch isn't uh, the same as it used to be. There used to be steps uh, right here on the side of it, but the guy used to stand on the porch and he was a big guy, kind of a bouncer. And if you wanted to go in, you'd just go up and stand beside him and he'd look around. So all was clear, he'd let you in. If he knew the cops were in the area, he'd ask you to wait until he was sure they were gone. But then one night, this only happened once to me. Uh, I, I don't know how often it, it, it happened, but it only happened once to me. One night, he wouldn't let us in the front door for some reason. So he brought us around the side here. And this at the time was a, was a narrow alley, I believe. There was a wall or something right here where we are now. But here's the fire escape to the East West Club. Yeah, so, and this ladder is newer. <laughs> the ladder I climbed up that night was really old and rusty and rickety. And yeah, but I really wanted to get into the East West Club and I was probably drunk anyway, so. So back down at the bottom of the hill here, in this building right here at the top, you see the Twilight Zone Sky Lounge. That was a lounge bar. Now it looks like they have windows that you can open, but back in the early 90s, they didn't. They just had, you know, big glass windows that didn't open and heavy, heavy drapes. And so what they would do at midnight is close the drapes and not let you out. You were locked in. Locked in. And I mean, even if you wanted to leave, they would not open the door for you. But the customers there were mostly Korean. And uh, they, I remember they had a pretty eclectic uh, playlist. Uh, they played things like, you know, uh, YMCA, Kung Fu Fighting, She Blinded Me With Science, Turning Japanese, you know, a lot of late 70s, early 80s, uh, eclectic stuff like that. So the first, I don't know, few times I came to Itaewon, I spent my, my midnight hours uh, at the Twilight Zone. Uh, that was before I, I knew about the Kettle House and, and the crowd out there. But then after the Twilight Zone opened at 4 a.m., I would come over to this back alley here and, oh gosh, this is gonna be tough to remember, but I think where this white building is, I think that used to be, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not completely sure, but there used to be a, a, a club here, a hip hop club called the Moon Night. Now, night is what Koreans call a night club, night to, yeah, so it was the Moon Night. And if you know anything about K-pop history, then you might already be aware that the Moon Nightclub is where some of the early K-pop stars uh, were, were basically born. This is where they honed their, their dance skills. Now, I would come in here at four o'clock in the morning and they had this big dance floor in the middle of the room. Now, the King Club was all focused on customers, right? They wanted numbers. And so they had a huge number of tables and a kind of a smaller dance floor. But here they had a huge dance floor and fewer tables. The tables kind of lined 
the sides of the of the space and without fail every time i came in here there was like a circle of people on the dance floor watching people dance out in the middle maybe a dance off or something like that i don't know they were doing break dancing you know all kinds of stuff but yeah you know the uh, pak jin young jyp uh, the, the guy who founded YG, uh, SM, I believe, Entertainment, those guys, they all uh, started here in a few K-pop groups. I believe it opened in 89. Now, the vibe here really started to change in the mid-90s. The Soul Pub opened uh, in 1995, and it kind of became a, a mainstay of Itaewon. Yeah. And where this building is, this went up in 2021, I think. Maybe 2022. I, I have some footage of its uh, construction when I filmed a walk through here, but I spent a lot of time in the building that used to be there. Um, in the early 90s, there was, a, there was a bar there called the Mug Club, and it was kind of unique in a way. Um, it was a hostess bar, and a hostess bar is where you have a bunch of women working there, and, you go in and buy them drinks and they sit and chat with you. And usually hostess bars aren't where people go to hang out, right? You, you don't go there just to go play darts or, or chat with your friends. You go there to chat with the women and buy them drinks. But this place, people actually went there to hang out and it was a fun bar. I used to love going there. Uh, met some interesting people there. One guy, a British guy, he's the reason I got on the dart team at, at the Soul Pub uh, later. He helped me uh, learn to play darts. And yeah, it burned down. <laughs> they, had a, they had a fire. I remember they had a t-shirt that said I was mugged in Itaewon or something like that. But yeah, they had a fire. And, and a couple of the women who worked there later opened their own bar uh, here on the main street. But then in, in 1996, I believe, there was a bar here that opened on the third floor of that old building called Woodstock. Uh, it was owned by Mr. Wu and his wife, Ms. Lee, um, they later, later divorced, and, uh, but Mr. Wu kept the bar up until he passed away in 2019. But I spent a lot of time in that place, and during the, the curfew days, uh, he had a, the most ingenious solution that I had seen among all the bars here. He rigged up a little button outside the main entrance to the building, and so when you wanted to go in after midnight, you would go up and push the button and a light would flash behind the bar. And when he saw that light, he'd come around uh, into the stair stairway, the staircase, stairwell, there we go, I'll get it eventually, uh, where you had the bathroom. And, and in the bathroom, there was a back door to the fire escape. So after you push the button, you'd go around the back of the building, climb up the fire escape. And this wasn't a fire escape like the one I showed you earlier with the ladder. This one actually had a staircase but you would climb up the staircase and he'd let you into the bathroom. And inside the building there, into the entrance to the bar, to the door to the bar, he had a, a shutter that he'd pull down. And, you know, he'd, you'd get in and he'd pull the shutter down. But the cops would come sometimes and start banging on the shutter and he'd turn the music down and shh, 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 be quiet. And uh, you'd just wait until the cops finished banging the, the shutter after five or 10 minutes and then turn the music back up and keep going. But yeah, that was, uh, that was fun. And he had a lot of live bands there too. I, I, I miss those days. The curfew was lifted around 1997. Um, they designated Itaewon a special tourist zone at the time and gave them a break from it. But it was lifted for the rest of the city, you know, not too long after, I, I don't know how long. Uh, 
as more and more bars opened here on the main street, the focus of the nightlife shifted from that area behind the fire station, which started to decline, and to the street here. And then property values started to rise because it became a hot spot for new property. You had chain stores coming in. You had name brand shops coming in to replace all the the, the cheap and expensive stuff. And it just got out of control. <laughs> the place gentrified. They tore down that row of buildings over there to make that new street. And back here too, this uh, completely changed from what it used to be. I uh, lived in a, in a house back here. It was an actual house. It was a two story house and they had converted their garage into a small apartment. My, my landlady was, a, was an older lady, an elderly lady, really kind, I, I adored her. Um, and it was my, my first time living without a roommate <laughs> in, in Korea or in my life probably. Uh, but yeah, it was just a quiet little residential street here. Now, down on the other side of the Hamilton Hotel, they, they had uh, some restaurants and stuff. But yeah, this, this section of the street was just, was just quiet. But now, look at this. Bars, restaurants, all over the place. And there, at the end of the street, there was another building there. That was a dead end. You had to turn left down that way and there was a little alley that went to the other street but they tore all that down to extend the street here so i never could have imagined that itaewon would would turn into this but the other thing that is interesting about this place is that there was no real international cuisine culture here in Itaewon. I mean, despite the fact that this was the number one spot for tourists and it was the center of expat life, you just didn't have options for international food other than, you know, McDonald's, KFC, Wendy's. There was an Indian restaurant right up here behind the Hamilton Hotel. And at some point in the mid to late 90s, a couple of Mexican restaurants opened but it was only in the 2000s that the real explosion of international food took off here and in 2002 the uh, itaewon global village festival uh, was started and this happened uh, every autumn and it was in october i believe and it was a weekend long thing where they would uh, shut down uh, the street here in what you, you know Itaewon Market area and set up a bunch of tents and local shops would international food shops would you know set up and start selling their stuff there and my wife and I opened a hot dog shop in 2012 2013 and we participated in the Global Village Festival one year selling hot dogs that was a fun time, <laughs> exhausting time. We, we sold a, a heck of a lot of hot dogs. In fact, we sold so many that we, we ran out of hot dog buns on day one. The, the hot dog buns that we had prepared for the whole weekend, we ran out on day one and our supplier had to make an emergency delivery the next morning. They didn't have to, but they very kindly did. We really appreciated that. But yeah, by the, by the end of the first day, we were just selling plates with chili on top of sausages because we had run out of buns. Another thing that changed over the years was the celebration of Halloween. Back in my day, it wasn't a big thing here. I mean, it was just an excuse to go out and drink. But, you know, a few of the bars would put up decorations and a couple of them might have uh, costume contests, but it wasn't a big deal. But after I stopped coming here, at some point in the 2000s, uh, this Halloween event started happening every year where they would shut down the street and huge crowds of people would come out in costumes and all the bars would be doing, you know, special stuff. And it stopped during the pandemic, of course, in 2020 and 2021, they didn't do anything, but in 2022, it opened again. And 
you know, apparently the authorities weren't fully prepared for what happened because it was right here in this alley that the, what's now called the Itaewon Crush incident happened. 159 people died, 196 injured. And now uh, this is called the October 29th Memorial Alley. I mean, it's just tragic. And the local business owners are still feeling the effects. You know, they were already struggling after the pandemic. And those who were hoping for a quick recovery, well, this incident put a damper on that. Uh, from what I understand, people I've talked to, whatever happens here, Itaewon has been evolving and changing and adapting since before I arrived, and I'm sure it will continue. And, you know, I, I look at, you know, this street especially, this is just so emblematic of the change in Seoul. There is nothing here that is familiar to me. All the, the, the sites that are in my memory from all the time I spent here in the 90s, there's very little left of it, yeah? But that's not a bad thing, not at all. Um, if I were younger or more amenable to coming out and drinking regularly, I'd probably explore this Itaewon that I don't know and see what it has to offer, but that's just not my speed anymore. But Itaewon will always have a place in my heart because basically, Itaewon introduced the world to me. It gave me the opportunity to speak and become acquainted and even become friends with people from all around the world, from diverse backgrounds and diverse lifestyles, people I never, ever would have had the opportunity to meet had I stayed in the southeastern United States. That's uh, going to do it for me this time. I hope you found something interesting in what I've shared in this vlog. I've tried to stick to memories that I'm sure about. You know, memory is such a fuzzy thing and mine just isn't the greatest. But I, if you, you know, know something that's different from how I remember it, please let me know. And if you've spent any time in Itaewon and have your own memories of Itaewon to share, please do so in the comments. I'd love to read about the experiences of others. And I'll probably come back here at some point in the future to, I don't know, maybe talk about some more explicit memories. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how it goes. But uh, anyway, as always, thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing and liking. And I will see you next time. Bye-bye. Here's a little concession to those of you who are looking for maybe some wilder stories. This building right here, uh, it looks to be the same building. It's, it's been modified quite a bit, but uh, here on the first floor, there was a club called Stompers when I first got here. It was a really popular spot here on top of the hill. I mean, Stompers was a popular, the Kettle House was popular, East West, Grand Ole Opry, they were all popular, busy places. Right next door to it, there was, uh, uh, there was a, a little mom-pop store, something they call a super, right? And it had a, a big square glass window, you know, a big one, uh, right next to the door. Just the whole storefront basically was, was a window. And one night, a guy I know 
came running into the kettle house uh, while I was in there. It was probably, you know, 2 a.m., something like that. And started telling me that uh, a Korean guy had hit him. And long story short, he didn't know when to quit. And he ended up getting thrown through the window. Now, I have never in real life seen anyone get thrown through a window. I have never in real life seen evidence of anyone being thrown through a window. You know, you see it on TV and in the movies all the time, but it, it, it blew my mind. I came out of the kettle house and saw that the window had been shattered and I had no idea that this guy I know, this acquaintance of mine, had been thrown through it. And I don't want to name the guy. I'll call him Mr. Red because apparently he was seeing red that night. Because when I got back to my apartment, which was about a five minute walk back over in that direction, I was living with a friend at the time. I came in to the apartment and my roommate says, you're not gonna believe what happened. And I'm like, what, what happened? Mr. Red came banging on the door. And when I let him in, he went straight into the kitchen, opened a drawer and grabbed a knife. And I had to wrestle him to get the knife away from him. All he wanted to do was come back and murder the guy who had thrown him through the window. He had a bad gash on his neck. I guess he's lucky he didn't, it didn't cut deeper or cut into an artery or whatever. But yeah, that was a, uh, kind of emblematic of life in Itaewon. It wasn't like that all the time in, in my personal experience, but you know, I couldn't be everywhere all at once. And I heard stories of things happening around that I didn't witness myself. But yeah, uh, it's, it's a reputation for uh, as being a place you didn't want your, your sons and daughters to visit uh, pretty well earned.